author David Brooks describes our country as a capitalist meritocracy. Isn't that a great word? Like, we, who talks like this? But it has that word merit in it. So what he basically is saying is that in our country, you get what you pay for, and you earn what you deserve. You get what you pay for, you earn what you deserve. And so we, have, we tend to have this mindset, okay, if I'm going to go pay a lot for something, I better get a lot. <laughs> so, like, for example, if I go to an expensive restaurant, I'm expecting everything to be awesome. So if, I'm, if I'm putting out a lot of money, I want everything. I want the taste, the atmosphere, the service, everything to be good. I, I remember, uh, I've talked about this restaurant before. It's been a while, but Pastor Shelley and I, we, there's a restaurant in downtown Seattle where the first time we went there was for a special occasion. I think anniversary was the first time we went there. And I knew something was different when the server said, may I give you my card? <laughs> what? <laughs> you have a card? <laughs> and he said, Anytime you come back to this restaurant, when you make your reservation, make sure you ask for me, and I will take good care of you. And he did. Like, we were, we were just blown away. Uh, for example, we said, you know, where's the restroom? Usually it would be, oh, it's over there. It's three blocks down. Turn around the corner. It's over there. Whatever. Find it. He's like, let me show you. And he just walks right over <laughs> and takes us there. What just happened? That's so great. And so then we returned to that restaurant several times because it was so amazing and we were always disappointed. Every time we had a very high expectation, but we never got him again. I don't know if he moved or whatever. He, we never got him again. And so we came in with these high expectations, and they were never met again going there. Now, on the flip side, maybe a more common example for all of us, when I go to a fast food restaurant, my expectations are down here. <laughs> Like, if, if I just get some food, it was probably a good day, you know. And if I got what I ordered, wow, that's <laughs> fantastic. But I do expect it to be fast. There is one restaurant in town I have quit frequenting because they should take the name fast off fast food. I will not tell you, but after I waited 20 minutes in that drive through <laughs> behind two cars, like, no. So, but on the flip side, when a fast food restaurant uh, worker does something nice or goes beyond, wow, that is a delightful surprise. I'll never forget when our son, daughter-in-law are in the hospital having their first baby, and we needed some food, remember that? And so I was sent out to, I think we're, it was like maybe 10 o'clock, all fast food restaurants in the area close at 10, but we got, we just like squeaked in, and I just remember uh, saying, oh, I'm so glad you're, you, you would take us for this order. My daughter-in-law is in the hospital having a baby. She goes, this meal's on us. I still remember that. It's fast food. You just, whoa, I, you exceeded my expectations at a fast food restaurant. So our expectations really play into our gratitude. They affect our gratitude. And we are in a series about gratitude. In fact, we're, we're talking about the power of gratitude, the power of gratefulness to God. And it's amazing how your expectations affect it. Now, truly grateful people, people who are grateful at their core, they don't see our country as a capitalist merit, meritocracy. They're not focused on getting what I paid for, getting what I deserve. Genuinely grateful people view the way things work as a gift economy. A gift economy. So gr truly grateful people see every good thing that comes to them as a gift from God, something to rejoice in. Their expectations are generally, genuine, generally low, and so they are on purpose. And so every blessing, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Genuinely grateful people aren't looking at what do I earn or what do I deserve, man. They're looking at how good God is because I can breathe today. And they see everything as a gift. They don't take anything for granted. Constantly impressed by the fact, wow, I've been given more than I deserve. Do you see how that's kind of the opposite of our mindset generally in our country? Uh, genuinely grateful people don't get mad when something doesn't go their way. 
And for grateful people, intentions matter. So when someone just tries to do something nice for a grateful person, they're grateful, even if it didn't work out very well. You know what I mean? Sometimes, sometimes people try to do something for you. Well, they tried. Uh, but a, a genuinely grateful people says, I'm thankful for you trying. That, I, I see your heart. That, that was awesome. Would you turn in your Bible to the book of 2 Chronicles? In your table of contents, it might look like 2 Chronicles. And uh, this is one of those uh, sections of the Bible that people make fun of it, of the name of it. But you know what a chronicle is? It's a historical record. So it's, it's just a book of historical records of God's people in a certain time frame. It was, it was the time when kings ruled in Israel. So it's the chronicles, it's the historical records, it's the story of that time, and it's the second uh, volume, it's volume two of chronicles. All right, so here's, here's the context before we start reading. It's, it's uh, sec- two chronicles, chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to be kind of summarizing chap- uh, verses 1 through 29. So here's the context. God's people, the Israelis, found themselves in a predicament during the time, it was centuries ago, when a certain king, King Jehoshaphat, was ruling. Could you just try saying it online too? Jehoshaphat, just try it. Because it just makes you smile, even to just say it. Like, wow, it's so great. King Jehoshaphat, that's a fun name. Yes, he was a good king. And the Bible, uh, actually the chronicler, <laughs> labels the ki- various kings of Israel as good or bad based on, did they put God first? King Jehoshaphat put God first in his life. So he was labeled a good king, but he was still human. And so when, he, when King Jehoshaphat heard that three neighboring enemy nations had united their forces into one army to come against them, and they were, they were marching against Israel, coming through the, the desert valley on their way to, towards Jerusalem, the capital city. When, when King Jehoshaphat heard this, it, he was terrified. It would be like saying Canada and Mexico were uniting against... No, no, it's not, it's not like that at all. I just said that to be funny. Okay. <laughs> I had to say that because it wasn't funny, so just to clarify, that's why I said it. Uh, but King Jehoshaphat, he was out-resourced and outnumbered. I mean, he's just little, uh, by this time, Israel had gone through a civil war, so it's, his country was just the smallest southern part, and three enemy, nation, enemy nations' armies were coming against him, all right? So he was like, we cannot fight this. We, we can't do this. He and his people were overwhelmed. What do you do when you're overwhelmed or terrified? And I have felt both <laughs> over the last couple years. I don't know if anybody else here listening to me has felt one of those emotions over the last couple years. It's totally human nature when you feel threatened, overwhelmed, terrified to do one of three things. Fight, flight, or freeze. Fight, flee, or noun, flight, or freeze. So I want to just look at those, those three ways of dealing with conflict or crisis really quickly. Uh, the fight. So what do you do when you realize that groceries have gone up 50 to 60% over the last month? Because that's what just happened. Certain groceries, more than 60%. Meat, more than 60% in the last month. This is crazy. But your paycheck has not gone up. Maybe your paycheck has been cut in half or eliminated. That is terrifying. That is overwhelming. What do you do? So many times we're tempted to just fight. Okay, I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to get an extra job. I don't care if I have to work on Sunday mornings. I'm just going to fight. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to make this happen in your own strength. Maybe I'm going to sell all my furniture. (laughs) I'm going to eat on the floor. (laughs) Or, Or maybe another way of fighting is you take out your frustration on those closest to you. Those are ways of fighting. Or maybe it's flight. What do you do when you're forced to decide between taking a vaccine you oppose or keeping your job? This is, all these examples are from this week. (laughs) Like this, I'm not making this stuff up. This is crazy. What do you do when you're forced to to choose between a a vaccine you, you don't, you don't, you oppose or having a job? 
oh my goodness, you, may, maybe you freeze. You, uh, uh, some people, maybe you panic, or maybe you do nothing, or you bury your head in the sand, and you hope it just goes away somehow, and yet that deadline is still coming. Well, the first thing that King Jehoshaphat did when he was overwhelmed and when he was terrified was to pray. And when he prayed, it made a difference. His prayer was written down in the Bible. So he's the king. He's not the pastor. He's the king. And he says, I'm praying. And he ordered the whole country to fast and pray with them. Like, wow, that was, that was a great time, 21 days of prayer and fasting, uh, where everyone, they did. And it says that families came to Jerusalem from, from around Judea, from around that area, and they, they came to the temple where they worshiped God in Jerusalem. And the Bible specifically, I love this passage because it specifically says that fathers, mothers, and their little ones were standing there in the courtyard of the temple of God praying. And King Jehoshaphat was out there, up, out in front, leading the way, and he led out in prayer. And so I want to look at how he prayed as a model for how to pray when you feel like you need to fight, flee, or freeze. This is a great model because he was facing uh, overwhelmedness, just like we are today. So first of all, he refocused on who God is. He refocused on who God is. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6. Partway through verse 6. This is what he prayed. Oh Lord, you are powerful and mighty, and no one can stand against you. So he started this prayer by focusing just on who God is. And as he prayed out loud, it affected the people around him. And pretty soon the whole country is just refocused on the fact that God is bigger, God is great, and no one can stand against him. The next thing he did is he remembered how God had already delivered them. And this is a very good way to pray, to remind yourself and remind God, God, I'm thankful for the, how you did this in my life, how you did this in my life, how you did this in my life. And this is what he prayed in verse 7. Oh, oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? God gave his people this land. And he's rem re remembering, God, you made a way. You cleared the deck, and you made a place for us to come. And that was you, God. You did that. Next thing he did, he reminded God of his, of his covenant promise. God had, you know what a covenant is? Like if you have bought a home in a development, you might know what a covenant is. It's, it's this agreement that everyone has to, uh, to agree to the terms and stuff. God made an agreement like that. Uh, with his people. And the, this is how he reminds him, middle of verse 7. And God, did you not give this land forever? That's your covenant, God. You gave this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham. He's reminding God, God, you gave us this land. A bunch of people are coming right now to try to take it. But God, I'm reminding you, you gave us this land. And then the last thing he did, he renewed the people's commitment to trust the Lord during times of crisis. So he quotes the earlier king, King Solomon, who had, uh, was responsible for building that temple. And, th and this is what he said at verse 8. Your people settled, he's still praying, God. God, your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we're faced with any calamities such as war, plague, famine, COVID, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. Do you see how he's praying? Man, this is a great way to pray. Pray these ways like he's done. Even get out this prayer and, and just pr pray it and, and put in your situation into what they, he was praying about. And in verse 11, then... After reminding the people, after reminding God who you are, what you've done, how great you are, how you've helped us in the past, after all that, then he says, here's what I'm asking for. <laughs> he, he did the praise first and the reminding and the faith statements first. And then he asked God, verse 11, Lord, you see this mighty army that's united against us. It's three nations coming against them. 
Verse 12, oh, our God, won't you stop them? Here's his prayer request. Won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We, don't, we do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. Yes. Wow. So I'm picturing a gathering kind of like this, only we're outdoors on the plaza. The king is praying. The nation is there. They're all, they're all looking to God. They're scared to death, but they're asking God for help. And then suddenly... God gave a word of prophecy. Prophecy is just simply speaking the words of God. It may or may not be about the future, but it's the words of God. That's a prophecy. Uh, and in this case, it was about the future through a church leader named Jehaziel. So they're all like this, and then someone in the congregation, one of the church leaders, he was a, a Levite, if you're familiar with that term, he uh, named Jehaziel. He starts speaking the words of God. And this is what it says, middle of verse 15. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Mm, hallelujah! That's so good. Tomorrow, march out against them. And then he even describes where they're going to be. The enemy is coming up this certain path, and by this certain path, go to that, go to that place, and you're going to see. And then verse 17, but he's saying to the people of God, you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, your battle positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Oh, wow. This was, this was a specific prophecy for this time. Uh, and so uh, an army may or may not do this. They might be led different ways, but this, they, they pressed into God. They prayed for an answer, and this was the answer that God gave them. Now, before I read the rest of this, I just got to stop here with a little word study because this is so good. When it says, take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. That's in verse 17. I just read that. That word victory, wait for it, Yeshua. That is the word, through a couple iterations, we translate, that's Jesus. Jesus. Stand still and watch the Lord's Jesus. That word means victory, deliverance, salvation. Okay, for, for you who are not Bible scholars, which is most of us, <laughs> I did the research, I'm not a scholar. Uh, this is before Christmas. This is before Jesus came. But Jesus is God. In the beginning, he was with God, and he is God. <laughs> And he was there. So the, God gives this prophecy through Jehaziel and said, stand still and watch Jesus do his work. Oh, I love that. And what is his work? Victory, salvation, deliverance. Wow. Oh, I love this so much. Verse 17, picking it up. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Wow! What an encouraging word from God. Lord, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Wow! The king, Jehoshaphat, is in front of the whole nation. People usually bow to the king, but the king bowed to God because there was one greater in that place, and that was God. The king bows to God. Everyone sees it. Oh, my word, the king is bowing to worship, and then everybody else bows to worship. The whole nation is gathered there. They're bowing in worship, and they're praising God for this word of encouragement. God's going to fight for us. We're not even going to have to fight, and he's going he's to win the battle. And I love this. <laughs> so the whole nation's bowing. And they're just like, oh, thank you, God. You're so great. And then the Bible says the worship band stood up and they praised God with a very loud shout. <laughs> Don't you love it? We got all these stately people, you know, like myself, and we're just all bowing. And then the worship band is like, get up, man. Plug in the electric guitar. Woo! Thank you, Jesus, for victory tomorrow. I love that picture. That is so great. So the next morning, 
King Jehoshaphat marched out early with his little army, and he encouraged them, and he said, trust God, and you'll be able to stand firm, and you will succeed. They're marching out to battle. He gives them this encouragement. Hey, everybody, it's going to be okay. Trust God. And then an idea comes to him. Oh, boy. Have you ever had it when your boss gets an idea? (laughs) Yeah. So the boss gets an idea. It seems like it just came out of nowhere. So it's not planned. It was very unconventional, extremely illogical. The army would not have even considered it if it had not been spoken by the king himself. If some soldier in the army had said, I got an idea, the commander would have said, no. (laughs) But the king said it, so they did it. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, middle, middle of the verse. The king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army. What? Wait, ahead? Okay, so picture an army going into battle. Everyone's coming against you with whatever the weapons were of the day, spears, swords, bows and arrows. And he puts the singers out front, the choir, the worship band, to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang, a very simple, beautiful song. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. In other words, express your gratefulness. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. That's that's the song. I, I don't know if you knew that Chris Tomlin wrote that in about like 500 B.C. or something. I mean, it was, that was awesome. And then it made its way to the Bible somehow. That's so cool. So they're expressing their gratitude to the Lord. Verse 22, listen to this. At the very moment, someone say at the very moment. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, those three armies, to start fighting among themselves. Okay, armies don't do that. They don't fight against themselves. And it sounds like two of them ganged up on the third one, and then the last, the remaining two started fighting each other until the battle was over. The Lord did a miracle as a response to their gratitude. So God's people trusted God so much that they put gratitude ahead of their own striving. They put gratitude ahead of their own fighting. They put gratitude ahead of their own marching, their own work. They put gratitude to God before. And the moment they expressed their gratitude to God, God caused the enemy armies to start fighting themselves until they all lay dead on the battlefield. Israel didn't have to do any fighting. The enemy was wiped out. The battle was over, and the Bible says it took three days to pick up all the plunder. I mean, they're all dead. They just go around picking up all the jewels, all the, all the, the weapons. Three days to collect all the plunder, all the blessing. Now, this was a delightful surprise. Okay, their, their expectations were down here. We're going to get slaughtered. This was a very delightful surprise. They didn't even have to fight. The, the battle was over, and they got all this plunder. It is amazing. They were given far more than they deserved. And here is the, here's the bottom line of this message. I'd summarize it this way. Expressing your gratitude to God brings relief. Expressing your gratitude to God brings relief. For the Israelis, it was relief from an enemy army. It was a very physical relief. For me personally, I've, I've been working on improving my emotional health lately. It's, it's been a long season, hasn't it? And uh, perhaps some of you are in the same boat. And so I've been seeking the Lord and just trying some different things. And one of the most helpful things when I am down, stressed, overwhelmed, confused, unsure what to do, one of the things that has helped me the most is making a list of things that I'm grateful to God for. I will write it down. I will speak it. 
I'll, I'll, I'll write it down and then read it to God and say, God, I'm thank you, thank, thankful for all these things. I, I'm thankful. And just that exercise of expressing thankfulness and gratitude to God changes my whole perspective, my mood, my outlook, everything. It is amazing when gratitude goes before the striving, what happens when you express it to God. So for me, expressing my gratitude to God brings relief, a different kind, a different kind of relief than the army experience. That's the power of gratitude. And that's why we're talking about the power of gratitude. That's how we fight our battles, by expressing our gratitude, our praise to God in, in, in worship. It, it's much more powerful to do that than even to fight, flee, or freeze. It's a very powerful thing that you can do by praising God, by expressing your gratitude to Him. When you're facing a battle, remember that group of singers marching in front of the army. Get that picture in your mind. And when you're facing a battle of temptation, depression, whatever, whatever kind of battle you're going through, hard choices, whatever it is, remember that army with the singers out front, the praise out front. Because you're going to be surprised what happens inside of you when you give your praise to God, when you just tell him, thank you, God, for this, 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 this. And the list is really pretty long when you think of it. We have a lot to be thankful for. So I, 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 in just a few moments, I've got a gift I'm going to give away. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to invite you in the room to stand and online to, to, to stand and get ready also. Let's sing a song of worship and praise. And this song we're going to sing was inspired by the Bible story we just talked about. I 
how I fight my battles. This is how I fight. This is how I, this is how I fight my battles with gratitude, with praise to God, expressing my praise to God. This is how we as a church fight. Isn't that a great way to fight? By praising God, by thanking Him for every good thing in your life. So I've got something here to give away. It is just a very simple book. It's, it's called I'm Grateful Every Day. It is a, just a daily gratitude journal just to encourage you to write down the things that you're grateful to God for. Last Sunday was Seahawks Sunday, and almost all of our giveaways, not all, but almost all of our giveaways went to women. So today, this is going to a guy. <laughs> this is going to a guy. Yep. Uh, and I specifically chose the nice, gray, dark, you know, manly-looking one <laughs> to give away. Um, and so I'm going to, if you want this, I'm going to give it to the first guy that I see. Raise your hand. Manuel, would you hand it to him for me, please, Pastor Christian? God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being here. Let's pray. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads right where you're at online? Join us too. This isn't, we don't watch prayer. We pray. We pray together. Let's do it. Lord, I just want to thank you for air to breathe. I thank you for a family who loves you. Lord, I thank you for a church that loves each other, loves me, loves you. Lord, I thank you for a free country where we can gather to worship you. Lord, I thank you that I had a meal this morning. Uh, Lord, I thank you uh, for my wife. Lord, I thank you for every good thing in our lives. I thank you that I was warm and dry last night. Lord, I do not take that for granted. Not everyone in the world is. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for every good thing. I thank you, Lord, for freshness in our church. I thank you for a future. I thank you for where you're taking us, Lord. I thank you for where we've been. I thank you that you're with us right now. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. You are awesome. I praise you. I love you. I worship you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Could we just for a moment do what I've just modeled for you and just simply tell God what you're thankful for. Is there, are you alive? That's something to be grateful for. Would you just begin to thank the Lord in your own words? Uh, and I encourage you to just do it out loud. You may not shout like me, I shout everything, but say it out loud because I want your ears to hear all the things that you're grateful to the Lord for. Okay, here, let's go. Let's just take a few seconds online in the room. Let's do it. Let's thank the Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything. And we've just begun really to scratch the surface, Lord. You've done so much. You have uh, saved us. For those of us who have put our faith in you, you've promised that a, us a home in heaven. There's so many things that are out there, but you've also done so many things. We have clothes. We have friends. We have a church. So there's so much to thank you for. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, for everything. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. I want to give you one more invitation this morning. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. The thing is, we all were facing an enemy, that sin and Satan. There was nothing we could do to save ourselves. We were overwhelmed spiritually. And God's penalty for sin is death. But the Lord said, turn to Jesus instead. And Jesus came he took the penalty. He took the death on the cross for you. And he won the battle for you. And I just want to invite you, maybe you never have done this, or, or maybe you need to come back to Jesus today. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, not yourself, not your striving, not in fighting, fleeing, uh, fleeing or freezing, but in Jesus to save you from your sin and give you life eternal. If you want eternal life today, would you just raise your hand and say, I want that. I want that. Yeah. 
I, I, several hands going up. Yeah, that's so good. God's doing something in people's hearts and lives right now. Online too. I cannot see you, but God can. Would you raise your hand to God? And I, I would love to just lead you in a prayer. The whole church is going to participate. We're going to all pray this together because those of us who have done this before, we love to do it every time. But if, if, if you just raise your hand, would you pray this prayer to God? You, you say it to God. Don't just say it to me, but say it to God. I'm going to coach you. Repeat after me. Let's do it. Church, let's do it together. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. And the answer to that prayer is always yes. God always forgives. When you ask him for forgiveness, he forgives. You are forgiven. You are saved. You are a child of God. You belong to him. So could we all just express thanks to God, our gratitude to God? Let's just hear a big old shout or a big old applause. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Amen. So I really want to know if you made that decision today online or in the room. So would you do one? You have two options just to let me know. Either take the Connect card that's in the seat back in, in front of you and check the box on the back that says, I prayed that prayer today. Or just even simpler, text the word GREET to our phone number, 97000. Um, RESTART. RESTART is the word. Text the word RESTART. So that'll let me know you prayed that prayer. Text RESTART. To, and, and if you fill out a Connect card, just leave it on the seat so we'll pick it up. Pastor, well, thank you, Pastor Garen. Uh, man, isn't isn't thankfulness, isn't gratitude powerful? The fact that you can like lead, walk in front of an army, trusting in the Lord and being thankful for what He has already done—that's powerful. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, spoiler alert: if you're new, you can text "greet" to ninety-seven thousand. Uh, that just helps us get connected with you. And if you are joining us online, would you just hit that subscribe button? All that does is just helps other people see our channel and hear the good news of Jesus. And for those of you um, who are staying, if you, if I could just have like two or three guys or gals just help me take a couple of these rows that we're going to be preparing for Together Nights later tonight, which you were all invited to. Come to Together Nights. It's a great time of connection. It's another service we offer. It was so good to see you this week. God bless you. See you next time.